For many of us, the first introduction we have to knitting comes in childhood when an older relative has tried to explain the mysteries of this most traditional of crafts, frequently with disastrous results. If, when you think of knitting, an unravelled mess of dropped stitches springs to mind, then this programme will definitely set you straight, because knitting truly is becoming an art form for the 21st century and beyond. Even the big Hollywood movie stars, who have been transformed into great style icons, have been known to take their knitting on set as a way of relaxing between scenes. So prepare to put all your preconceptions on hold while we celebrate the art of knitting and we'll guarantee you'll be amazed at what can be achieved with a pair of knitting needles and a ball of yarn in a very short space of time. Knitting has literally been around for centuries and the sight of knitted jumpers and shawls are both a familiar and very comforting sight all over the world. Although it's impossible to pinpoint the exact date of when the first stitches were cast on, there are many examples of ancient knitting as it would appear that almost every civilization had its own form of the craft. Over the years, knitting has grown in popularity, progressing from humble origins as a basic means of clothing production to a treasured pastime that has been handed down through the generations. And what's even better news is the fact that learning to knit costs very little money and can be carried with you wherever you go. A person who knits will never find themselves at a loose end, if you'll pardon the pun, because they'll always have a knitting project of some description on the go and usually be carrying it with them. Most importantly of all, the totally unique finished product can be worn with real pride. There's a wonderful sense of satisfaction to be had from making your own clothing and you can also save a great deal of money as professionally knitted garments will invariably be very expensive indeed. And of course, when you've completed your own wardrobe, don't forget that such beautifully handmade items will also make wonderful gifts. Christmas just wouldn't be Christmas without a knitted woolly jumper and at this most hectic time of the year you might be interested to know that it's a proven fact that knitting can lower stress levels so learning how to knit is not only extremely satisfying but also very useful as well. There was a time, and not so very long ago, when all little girls were taught to knit and even in schools up until the 1970s, it was considered an important part of home economics. As needlecraft, woodwork and cookery transformed into textiles, resistant materials and food technology, knitting was lost in the mist of time, along with skills like preparing a proper meal from scratch. Grandparents took over teaching knitting to both boys and girls, but sadly it's a skill that did go into a decline. As this trend is rapidly being reversed now, 
Unfortunately, there are fewer people who can knit to pass on the skills. If you have a knitter in the family, then all is well. But if not, this introduction to knitting will get you started. And in this case, practice really will make perfect. We'll now take a look at how to cast on and off, see how to complete a basic line of stitching and move on to some really attractive but straightforward styles of knitting. The skills demonstrated in the next 60 minutes will give you the confidence to try this wonderfully traditional craft for yourself and who knows where it might lead you. One of the big pluses of knitting is the minimal amount of equipment you need to set you on your way. The only essentials are a pair of knitting needles and a few balls of yarn, and the rest is down to you. Nevertheless, when you first walk into a shop that sells knitting supplies, you'll be amazed at the variation in needles and yarn. We'll start with the knitting needles and to begin with it's best to buy a simple pair of single point needles. These are made of wood, metal, plastic or glass and as the name suggests they're only pointed at one end and have a stopper at the other to ensure that the stitches don't slip off. The quality can vary, however, even the very best needles should cost you no more than a few pounds. Try handling a pair of knitting needles and choose the ones that feel most comfortable for you. Knitting needles come in a daunting array of sizes, but when you find out how the system works, it really isn't as confusing as it might seem. When you follow a pattern, in most cases it will give you a needle size to use, but the most common sizes vary from 2mm, known as a size 14, up to about 10mm, which is a size 000 needle. When you're getting started, it's best to use a 6.5mm size 3 needle, which will give you a nice large stitch and make it easy for you to see what you're doing. The different sized needles are used to control the tension of the knitting, referring to the number of stitches per inch, these days in metric about a 3cm area. For example, the bigger sized 000 needles may produce only 4 lines of stitching, while size 14 needles might make 12. What this means in the most basic terms is that using bigger needles will make your knitting grow more quickly, but the stitches will be much looser, which is fine for lacy decorative effects. However, if you want a warmer garment with a close-knit finish, you'll need to go at a steadier rate with smaller needles. Once you've sorted out the needles, the next task is to choose your yarn. The range of options is quite incredible and the first thing you will notice is that the cost per ball varies dramatically from really inexpensive synthetic yarn right through to highly priced Angora wool. To begin with, it's best to use the yarn suggested by your pattern and on every label you'll usually find the range of needle sizes the yarn is suitable for. Here's a really important point to remember when selecting yarn. As an example, you might be knitting a jumper which requires 9 balls of crimson red wool and you need to buy them all at the same time. 
you need to make sure each ball comes from the same dye lot, otherwise your finished garment will vary very slightly in colour throughout. When you begin knitting, it's best to use a fairly plain and simple yarn until you get used to the stitches. One of the most popular yarns is sheep's wool because of its versatility, but synthetic wools are very useful too and much more economical. Watch out for textured yarns or fancy metallic finishes. They're wonderful but can be difficult to handle when you're getting started. With your pattern, yarn and needles you're ready to go. But darning needles, a sharp pair of scissors, a ruler, knitting markers and some pins will prove useful, along with a good bag to keep all your bits and pieces in. None of these items will break the bank and will certainly help you on your way. So now we've gathered all our knitting kit together, we can get ready for casting on, which when you know how it's done is very easy indeed. To start, all we have to do is make a slip knot. Just take your yarn and unravel about 50 centimetres and make a loop just like we're doing here. Very simply reach through the loop and grab the strand that is closest to you. Bring the strand through as a new loop and tighten it off and there's our slip knot. The slip knot is the first cast on stitch and to continue simply tighten it up and place one of your needles through the knot gently. Now we're ready to continue the rest of the casting on process, which is basically carrying on in the same vein to create as many stitches as required. We'll go through the next step quite slowly, however once you've grasped the basic principle you'll be able to put it into practice very quickly. As we explain the various techniques in knitting, we'll demonstrate right-handed because many people believe that even if you're left-handed, this is the easiest way to learn. Nevertheless, this is purely a matter of preference. So if you'd rather knit with the left as the dominant hand, then simply adjust accordingly. Hold the needle with the slip knot in your right hand. Tighten the right strand in that hand and wrap the left strand around your thumb like this. Now simply push the needle up through the loop on your thumb and then loop the right hand yarn over the needle. Insert your needle back through your thumb loop, remove your thumb and gently tighten up your new cast on stitch. Now all you have to do is keep repeating the process until you have the desired number of stitches. And as we're just practicing, about 20 stitches will be a good number to begin with. And that's the first step mastered, so now we can actually start knitting. To begin with, concentrate on getting the stitches correct and not dropping any unintentionally so it's a good idea to go nice and slowly. It will make it easier if you try to remember that you're replacing the left hand thumb with a knitting needle. With the needle in the right hand you need to insert it from front to back through the first stitch on the left hand needle, just like you did with the loop on your thumb. 
your needles should be crossing over each other with your right hand needle below the left. Try to keep the needles crossed and touching at this point so the stitch that you create doesn't work loose. Loop the yarn around the right hand needle exactly like you did while casting on. Now insert the right hand needle back through the loop on the left hand needle. You should have the new loop over your right hand needle, so very simply slide the new loop off the left hand needle and onto your right hand needle and that will be your first stitch of your row of knitting. Some people remember this by saying in, round, under and off and it can be quite helpful. Carry on using this method for the whole row and when you're at the end, simply swap the needles over and keep going. This type of knitting is commonly known as garter stitch and it isn't really used a great deal in knitting patterns by itself, but it is the stitch that all knitters generally begin with and when you see the instruction, knit one, purl one, this is the knit part of that stitch. After you've become confident producing rows of this knit stitch, it's time to turn our attention to its partner, the purl stitch. Before you start, it helps to mention that purl is the reverse of the knit stitch. Again, start with the stitches in your left hand and make sure that the yarn thread is now falling to the front. Insert the right needle from the back to the front of the first stitch to create an X. Keep the needles steady again so the knot stays nice and tight and just like the knit stitch, we have to wrap the loose yarn around the right hand needle. The next stage is just the reverse of the hooking stage of the knit stitch as you take the right hand needle back through the loop on the left needle. Now gently slide the stitch off and that's all there is to it. You've just completed a purl stitch. You can continue to purl all along the row now and simply swap needles over when you get to the end just as you did with the knit stitch. If you carry on doing one row of knit and one row of purl throughout an entire garment, you'll be producing what's commonly known as stocking stitch, which is one of the most widely used types of knitting that's found in many different patterns. If you were to ask an experienced knitter which stitches a beginner ought to learn first, they would probably tell you that there are only three ways to work yarn, basically the knit, purl and slip stitch. Here we really have left the best till last, as the slip stitch is the simplest of all to knit, as all you need to do is pass the stitch from the left hand needle to the right without working it at all. It may be very simple, however it's used in all sorts of different stitching techniques to create varying effects. Also, slip stitches are frequently used in clothing patterns to help ensure your piece of knitting has nice, neat edges. On your practice sample, slip all your stitches from one needle to the other, just to be sure that you can do it without dropping them. It's extremely simple and takes very little effort, but it's just one of those essential stitches to know so that you can move on to more interesting knitting patterns rather than sticking to simpler ones. Slipping stitches is very handy if you want to store some unfinished knitting for any period of time and here we're actually using a stitch holder rather than a knitting needle to do this so that none of the rows of knitting unravel when it's put away.
It's now best to practice these three knit stitches for quite a few rows until you're confident that you can knit them with ease. In fact, you'll be really surprised how quick you will get in a very short space of time. However, before we move on to the next stage and some more interesting stitches, there is still a basic skill that we need to learn, which is to cast off. If you don't get this right, unfortunately all your knitting will unravel when you take it off the needles, so watch carefully. To cast off, first of all knit two stitches in the normal way, then with the left hand needle place the point through the first stitch, bring it over the top of the second stitch so the right hand needle can be drawn through the first stitch and tightened off. When casting off be careful not to pull too hard as it's easy to over tighten the stitches and you can ruin the seams or neckband of a garment if this happens. The next step is to knit one more stitch so we again have two stitches on the right hand needle. Now we're ready to carry out the process again and we continue along the row until we have cast off all but one of the stitches. Then the whole piece of knitting can be removed, at which point cut the yarn leaving at least 15 centimetres of it hanging so it can be threaded through the last loop and tied off. And that's all there is to it. You've now learnt the principles of knitting and you really will be amazed at what you will be able to produce with these simple techniques. Now when you start knitting you do tend to think in terms of two needles and suggesting four would sound horrendously complicated. However, when you've got the basics under your belt there are many different ways to use needles to knit. To begin with, we'll take a look at what is known as knitting in the round, a technique that can create seamless garments such as socks and hats. For this, you can use either double pointed or circular needles, and again, there's a huge variety in your local knitting or craft shop. At first sight, it does look very advanced, however, it's not that much different to knitting with two needles. We're going to use a set of four needles to show you how easily we can create a seamless piece of knitting. Cast on as you normally would. You can either place all your stitches onto one of the needles and then share them out between the other two, or cast a third of the stitches onto each needle. The end result's the same, so just use whichever technique works best for you. However, do be careful and watch that your stitches don't become twisted where the needles join, because unfortunately, it's quite easily done. Once you've got the desired number of stitches, use your fourth needle as you would your free needle when you normally knit. Each needle will therefore be used to knit off as you work your way around the line of stitches. Just remember when knitting in the round to be aware that the outside of the work is facing you at all times, so to create a knit effect on your garment you'll have to purl any knit stitches and for a purl stitch you'll have to knit. Most patterns for knitting in the round will explain this and you'll soon get the hang of it. Just take a look at this really fine piece of knitting that was done in the round. It's absolutely beautiful and shows what you can achieve with this technique and it has to be said, years of experience. 
We've come a long way in a surprisingly short space of time, so we can now move on to some different knitting stitches. When you first see some of the more complex looking patterns, they can seem a little daunting. However, as we already know, most simply use a combination of knit, purl and slip stitch to create some very attractive results. First up, think back to stocking stitch with alternating rows of knit and purl, which may look delightful but does have a tendency to curl at the edges. Consequently, it's not ideal if you want to make a scarf that really does need to hang straight. However, a stitch that people do use for scarves is the ribbing stitch. It's fairly similar to stocking stitch, but instead of working in rows, you work in columns. Working along, you knit one, purl one, knit one, purl one, alternating your stitches for each row of knitting. As you do this, just try to make sure that all your purl stitches are on top of each other so that they create columns and this will give you a much neater result. Many people use ribbing stitch when they want their garments to have a certain amount of elasticity to them, so it's knitted into cuffs and children's clothing. There are endless variations of the ribbing stitch. For example, you may want to work in clumps of three or five. Try it for yourself purling five, knitting five, purling five, knitting five, and so on. This will create a really thick stitch that looks great on jumpers. You can even mix up the purls and knit stitches to create all sorts of effects, from diamonds and circles to stars and waves. So be as creative as you like and see what kinds of patterns you can come up with. Now, before we race ahead of ourselves and move on to more stitches for your knitting repertoire, it's a good time to pause and take a closer look at knitting patterns, as most people get extremely confused when they're getting started. Knitting patterns have to be followed when making anything more complicated than a scarf but as you can see for yourself, they do at first glance resemble some sort of elaborate mathematical formula. But don't be put off by the jumbled mess of numbers and letters, for just like maths, it's very easy to follow when you know a few basic rules. All you have to do is look for the abbreviations key and you can quickly work out what all the letters and numbers stand for. We can see that K stands for knit and P stands for purl. So when we look at a pattern that says K1, P1 from start to end, it simply means we have to knit one and purl one all along the row of stitches. Patterns can get more intricate when making larger garments, however as long as you keep referring to the key and checking that you're following the pattern to the letter and the number, there's no reason why your knitting shouldn't look exactly like the picture. 
The terms DEC and INC often crop up in patterns and are simply abbreviations for decreasing or increasing the number of stitches, which is essential when you need to change the shape of the item that you're knitting. It's no good making a hat if you can't make it taper up towards the top or a sleeve that needs to get smaller at the cuff. Firstly, we'll look at the process of decreasing, or in simpler language, taking stitches away from your row. The easiest method that many people use very successfully is the knit together technique and all you do instead of knitting one stitch at a time is insert your right hand needle through two stitches on the left hand needle. Then complete the stitch as you normally would by pulling the loop through the two stitches and you can see that you're left with one less stitch. You can even do this with three stitches and you can also purl two or three stitches together in exactly the same way. This technique however will slant your knitting to the right and there will of course be times when you want to slant your knitting to the left. For this we use a very simple method called slip knit pass and it really is just following these three already mastered techniques. As you can see demonstrated here, slip a stitch over, knit the next one as you normally would and then pass the slip stitch over the knit stitch just as you would if you were casting off. In a few seconds, you'll have mastered a very simple and effective decrease to the left. Now we can move on to the increase, which allows us to make extra stitches out of the garment so that we can widen our knitting when a pattern dictates. There are many different ways to increase and indeed decrease stitches. However, as we're trying to keep things at a good basic level, we'll look at one of the simplest ways. A great technique is the bar method, which is created by simply knitting twice into a stitch. As you can see, all that we do is knit the stitch as normal and then instead of transferring the stitch over, we twist the needle around the yarn and insert into the back of the same stitch and make another knit stitch. When we transfer the stitch over, there will be two stitches rather than one coming from the same loop. There are more invisible ways of making extra stitches, as the bar method may leave a very small hole. However, it's perfectly acceptable when you're learning to knit and want to quickly increase your stitches. With the stitches and techniques already covered, you will have plenty of scope to knit just about anything you want, from hats and scarves to jumpers and cardigans. There will of course quickly come a time, however, when you want to start making even more complex designs, full of different embellishments and intricate needlework. A very popular example of attractive knitting comes from openwork patterns, which knitwear designers and high street stores use a great deal in fashion items. When you have a look in a pattern book, 
you'll often see the abbreviation YON, which stands for Yarn Over Needle. Watch carefully and you'll see that all you have to do is place the yarn over the needle in the desired position as you knit to form the hole in the garment. Whenever you do this, however, you must remember to decrease the number of stitches by one so that at the end of the row you have the same number of stitches as you cast on. So, for example, if you want three holes using the yarn over needle method on a row of stitches, then you must decrease the number of stitches in that row by three, following each YON with a decrease stitch. When you've learnt the yarn over needle method, it's possible to create all manner of different patterns. Some are simple to produce while others are a little more complex. But again, as we've said before, once you get the hang of it, you'll have no problem at all. Knitting practice really does make perfect and the one thing knitting will very quickly give you is the taste for a challenge. Now nobody's suggesting that you start off with the following ideas but it will give you something to think about and you'll know when you're ready to move on. To begin with we'll take a look at cable stitch which is used to create the wonderful rope-like patterns that adorn traditional woolen jumpers. These old styled patterns are starting to make a comeback and really help to give added interest to any garment that you produce. There are many different types of cable stitch, but all use the cable back and cable front method to create their varied effect. To make these stitches, you're going to need a small spare needle or cable needle. And the reason for this is that to produce the cable effect, you have to hold stitches while you carry on knitting. And then when required, you'll knit these held stitches back into the garment again. Here you can see a very simple way of creating a cable pattern using the cable four back and front method. First of all, knit along the row until you get to the desired position. Then with your spare needle, slip two of the stitches onto the cable needle and move it to the front of the work like so. Carry on knitting two more stitches in the normal way and then knit across the two stitches that you were holding to the back. This will then produce a crisscross looking design as two stitches cross over the other two. As you continue the pattern, you need to alternate between cable front and cable back method so that the cable pattern twists in and out of itself. Therefore, with the next row of stitches continuing the cable, you will find yourself holding the stitches to the back of your garment. Carry on alternating this technique and as you see here, you'll quickly and effortlessly create a wonderful cable pattern that you could use for many garments. As mentioned earlier, there are many variations on the cable stitch and you may want to hold three or five stitches or make a ribbed cable that has straight sections in it. <laughs> 
Whatever you do, crack the basic method first and then the rest will follow with practice. Another form of patterning that looks great on your knitting is a raised stitch design and you can create bobbles and all sorts of other trimmings that rise out of the knitting surface with this technique. Sometimes people sew on these raised objects to create the desired effect. However, we're going to produce them a much more enjoyable way by actually layering the embellishment on top of an individual stitch. It may sound a little confusing, but the best way to learn it, as ever, is to actually do it. We'll be making a small bobble using a method very similar to the bar increase technique demonstrated earlier on. It's always best to start off your bobble on a knit row if you're using stocking stitch. One important point to remember here is not to remove the stitch from the left hand needle as it will enable you to knit more than one stitch onto the loop. So for making the small bobble we first knit into the front like you would a normal stitch. However instead of passing the stitch to the right hand needle we're going to knit another stitch into the same loop on the left just as we did with the increase. Now instead of passing the stitches over, knit into the stitch one more time, into the front, so that there are three stitches out of the main one. Pass these three stitches over and do the same with another stitch. When you've finished, you should see that there are six stitches coming from the two main stitches in the knitting. Now very simply turn your knitting around and knit across these six stitches, then turn the work around again and purl across the six stitches. Carry on until you have six rows of stitches along and up and you'll have created a 6 by 6 knitted embellishment on the two original stitches. Turn your work around for the last time so that your knitting is in its original position. All there is left to do now is to knit the bobble back into line with the rest of the garment. You can do this by using a method very similar to that of casting off. The six stitches should be on the left hand needle and with the right hand needle insert into the second stitch. Once you have done this pass it over the first stitch and the point of the left hand needle so it hooks onto the yarn. There should now be five stitches of the bobble. With the right hand needle insert it into the second stitch and once again draw the needle over the first stitch. Carry this on until the bobble is held by only one stitch. Simply knit the stitch over the right hand needle and continue to knit the rest of the row and you've just created a bobble. <laughs>
Using this technique, you can create smaller or larger bobbles because all you have to do is knit less or more onto the stitches that the bobble is fixed to. So far, we've concentrated on the knitting, stitching and various techniques and to show this most clearly, we've stuck to one colour each time. But one of the greatest joys of knitting is using lots of different colours. Stripes, spots or even random designs look fantastic and you will need to be able to change yarns to do this. But again, it's very easy when you know how. To do this, all you need will be balls of yarn of your desired colours, a steady hand and we'll return to our practice piece of knitting to show you the rest. When you've finished a line of stitches, all you actually need to do is add the new colour in place of the old one. Just loop the new colour over your needle and begin your row of stitches and it should hold just as well as the previously used yarn. When you do this, make sure that you leave at least 10 centimetres of yarn hanging free from both the old and new yarn. If you want, you can loosely tie these two ends together to ensure your garment doesn't unravel. However, when you finish knitting the whole piece, you'll have to darn these edges in properly on the reverse side of the garment to give a more professional finish, as well as ensuring that it can withstand day-to-day -day wear and tear. The technique of polka dots or any colour that doesn't start at the beginning of a row is much the same and people make all manner of complicated looking designs with this method. Just make sure again that you leave enough of the yarn hanging loose so that it can be darned and secured when finishing. If you're knitting a patterned pair of gloves that seem to alternate colours on every other stitch, then if you have to keep cutting and darning the loose yarn, it really will take a very long time to finish off. Don't worry though, it's possible to simply keep the yarn attached if you're constantly changing, as long as you don't carry the yarn for more than five stitches horizontally or vertically. If you do, then the back will start to look very messy and you'll be in danger of getting all the bits tangled. As you can see, we're alternating colour every other stitch here by simply carrying the two colours over the stitches at the back so we don't have to keep cutting the yarn. Knitting in colour is much simpler than it might at first seem if you remember not to get the yarns tangled and always make sure you have enough free hanging yarn to darn it in safely when you're finishing off. As we learn to knit, there's one thing we can all be certain of, that basically we all will make mistakes. But this is really no cause for concern, because with a bit of know-how, most of the commonest faults are easily fixed. Unintentionally dropped stitches will probably be the problem you'll encounter most frequently, especially if you're using fancy yarns with lots of strands. A drop stitch is basically when you miss a stitch and it goes unknitted for that row, and if these are left they will unravel further and cause you all sorts of headaches. Some people unravel the rows of knitting until they reach the drop stitch, which is fine if you're only a few stitches on, 
However, if you've knitted 10 rows, you don't really want to have to unravel that much. All you actually need to do is use a crochet hook, as they're great for fixing problems in your knitting. Simply knit along the row of stitches until you're directly above the drop stitch. You should be able to see the little loop and the horizontal ladder of yarn that's above it. Now place the hook through the loop at the bottom and pull the horizontal cord that is directly above it through the loop so you create a new loop. Then do the same with the yarn above the new loop. Keep hooking the loops until you reach the top and when you do, simply slip the loop over the left hand needle and you have quickly and seamlessly fixed the problem. Just remember to use the hook from front to back if you're working a knit stitch and back to front if it's a purl stitch. Not everyone who knits does so by hand, as for some people these faults are all too annoying and the alternative of machine knitting can offer a more reliable way of enjoying this much loved craft. It may not be as relaxing as knitting with two needles and a ball of yarn, however, if you want to produce high quality garments in a fraction of the time, then there really can be no comparison. An English reverend, who apparently was so annoyed by the constant clatter of his wife's knitting needles, wanted to make something that would bring him some peace, so he created the first knitting machine, quite incredibly, during the reign of Elizabeth I in 1589. At one stage, knitting machines became even more popular than weaving machines, because they were almost 20 times faster. The knitting machine was also responsible for bringing more men into the industry and some knitting machines are able to perform more than 4 million stitches each and every second. Now the machine that we have here may not be quite as impressive as that, nevertheless it's still much speedier than hand knitting. There is a school of thought that believes these machines take much of the enjoyment out of the craft, but the old expression, horses for courses, certainly comes into play. As a knitter, you can choose whichever method suits you best, with machines proving no threat to the age-old tradition of a handicraft. And often, a person who enjoys knitting uses both techniques, depending upon what they want to create. And on that very positive note, sadly, our time enjoying the delights of knitting is at an end. However, we do hope that during the last hour, you've learnt the necessary techniques to produce your own handmade garments, or at least picked up enough information to give this wonderful pastime a try. In this day and age of mass-produced items and goods, it's really refreshing to be able to make original items of clothing for yourself, family and friends. Knitting is truly creative, aids relaxation and brings families together as we pass on these skills through the generations and in the 21st century is finally being recognised as an art form. This is one traditional craft that we can all treasure as part of both our heritage and our future and that has to be a very good thing indeed. Mm -hmm.